Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the afternoon. It looked like a beautiful day outside. It's supposed to be another gorgeous day tomorrow, so we definitely like those when it warms up a little bit. I'm sure we'll have some more cold weather. We'll enjoy this while we have it. Uh, just a reminder, those that we mentioned this morning, remember again, Chester has been doing better, but he does have a blood clot in his leg right now, so please pray that they they are giving him some blood thinners, and hopefully that will uh, help that situation. Uh, continue to remember Jacqueline as she heads toward her surgery on March the 14th. Uh, remember the family of Nancy Scott Collier, who we were praying for, but she did pass away this weekend. Uh, so please pray for that family in their time of grief. Uh, and then Lane's grandson, Hudson, as we said, fell and broke his collarbone. Lane said he's, he's doing pretty well, though, but uh, children do heal quickly. But let's pray that everything heals up good like it's supposed to. Uh, he's back uh, climbing all over like he wants to be. Uh, that's all I have on the updates. So we're going to turn the song service over to Brother Cheryl. And at the appropriate time, Brother Steve will lead us in our opening prayer, and then Brother Maurice will have our dismissal prayers. Brother Cheryl. Amen, everybody. Please get your songbook and turn to number 166. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never 
Oh. 
This morning we began looking at the book of Jonah, and we noticed that Jonah was a prophet of God, and God gave Jonah a mission. And he told Jonah, he said, I want you to go to the city, the great city of Nineveh, and I want you to preach to those people because they are wicked, and you need to pre pre uh, preach repentance because they need to turn from their ways, or they will be lost. And we saw how Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. And as I said, there are really, I think, three reasons. We're going to look at the second and the third one tonight. This morning we noticed because he was probably terrified because the Assyrians weren't the friendliest people around. And they tortured a lot of the people that they encountered. And so he was probably very afraid to go there to Assyria. And so rather than going northeast to Nineveh, he headed west and uh, got on the ship and thought that he could disappear and hide from God but he found out that's not possible and so God punished him by sending a great storm that was going to wreck the ship and we saw how the captain and the crew realized they figured out it had something to do with Jonah they prayed to their gods and, and nothing changed and Jonah told them that, yes, it was his fault because God was punishing him because Jonah was fleeing or trying to flee away from him. And so he told him, you boys, you should just throw me overboard. They resisted that at first, but we left off this morning. They did, in fact, throw him overboard. The storm immediately stopped once they did that. And so the good news was, even though Jonah had been disobedient, kind of a positive side effect of that was these unbelievers on the ship, they were converted, and they believed in God, and they sacrificed to him, and they vowed that they would follow him. So in spite of what Jonah did, that was something positive that came out of it. So tonight, we want to continue on. We mainly looked at uh, chapter 1 this morning, so we're really going to focus a lot of our attention tonight on chapters uh, 2, 3, and 4. And so if you would turn to the book of Jonah, if you're not already there. And so tonight we want to take a look at Jonah's repentance. Okay, so they throw him overboard. And you notice there in chapter 1 and verse 17, the last verse of chapter 1. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And so we talked about how that was a... A miraculous event and this is what happened when they threw Jonah uh, into the Mediterranean Sea so Jonah is in the belly here for three days and three nights and if that sounds familiar it should we talked a little bit the, uh, this morning about another bit of foreshadowing where Jonah was sleeping in the hold of the ship while this massive storm was going on and seemed to bother him and we noted there was a similar incident with Christ in the New Testament where he was sleeping and all his apostles thought they were all going to be killed and Jesus was just sleeping peacefully away. So a little bit of foreshadowing here with Jonah. Well, we also see another instance of that right here, okay? Because that should sound familiar because that's a foreshadowing of Christ being in the tomb for three days and three nights. In fact, if you'll hold your place here, turn over to Matthew chapter 12, we see that Jesus made specific reference to Jonah and this particular incident. So it was a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 39. They had asked Jesus. They wanted to see some signs. Okay, show us, show us you're the Son of God. Show us some miracles. We want to see some signs. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, 
so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay? Now, we see something else here. So we got the foreshadowing, but back however many years ago it was when I finally decided, hey, you know what? I need to do something crazy. I need to start seriously studying the Bible. What a radical idea. But once I realized that I hadn't done that in my life, I needed to start doing that. Oh, I thought I had found something. Right? So when I was growing up and went to Sunday school and when they would talk about this story, they'd talk about Jonah being in the well. Right? And when you read Jonah, it doesn't say that. Right? It says there, and again in verse 17, uh, a great fish. And then it says he was in the fish's belly. It never says it was a whale. Okay? So I thought I had discovered something. Well, we don't know if that was a whale. Everybody's told me it was a whale, but we don't know that because it doesn't say that. Right? And it made me think back to, uh, you know, in the Garden of Eden, right? I was always taught, well, when Eve ate that apple, well, was it an apple? We don't know. It doesn't say. It's fruit. Could have been a banana or an orange or we don't know what it was. It was fruit, but I was always taught that it was an apple. So I thought I'd found another one of those. Oh, well, here's another example of everybody says it's a whale, but how do we know it's a whale? Because it's a great fish. Well, when you see Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, yes, in fact, it was a whale. So it doesn't say that in Jonah, but Jesus tells us it was a whale. So as I further studied, I came across that and realized, oh, well, I thought I was smarter than I was. I thought I had that figured out, but I hadn't studied enough, right? So again, it, it's in the Bible, we need to study everything that you see about a topic if you want to get the complete picture. So that's how we know that Jonah was, in fact, in the belly of a whale. Now, and going back to Jonah chapter 2, we're not going to read chapter 2, but you see in this chapter several references to being low. So Jonah was, first of all, he was low in the bowels of the ship. And then they throw him overboard, and so he's low in the ocean. Then he's low in the whale's belly. And so what this demonstrates, and not trying to be funny here in all seriousness, this was a low point in Jonah's life. And that, that's it's trying to demonstrate that Jonah was low at this point because he finally realized when he wakes up and the storm's going on and he realizes it's his fault, he knows why. And he told them why. He told the sailors, well, it's because I was trying to flee from God. So he doesn't have to scratch his head and try to figure it out, well, why would God be mad at me? He knows, okay? And he understands that he has defied God and he has gone against God. So this is a low point for him. But the good news is that Jonah is going to turn it around. Okay, Jonah is, he realizes the mistake he's made and he is truly sorry. He has that godly sorrow knowing that he's really messed up and he's, he's displeased God. So he repents for disobeying God, he pledges to God that I will obey you from now on. I'm sorry, I didn't obey you, I should have, but I will. I won't make that mistake again. He vows that he will obey him going forward. And so notice there in the last verse of chapter two, in verse 10, because of Jonah's repentance, notice what God does. And the Lord spake into the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So God forgave Jonah. God was merciful to Jonah. That's important. So just kind of remember that because we're going to come back to that, okay? But God was very merciful to Jonah, and he had the whale spit him out, okay? Because Jonah repented. If Jonah hadn't repented, then God would not have extended his mercy. But because he repented, God did such, and Jonah was appreciative of that. Well, now... As we go into chapter 3, notice in the first verse, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So once again, God says, All right, let's try this again. I want you to go to Nineveh, not Tarshish. I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach to the Assyrians. 
But notice this time in verse 3, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city three days journey. So again, huge place. But this time Jonah fulfills, he, he pledged he would do what God said, so he does. And he goes to Nineveh and he preaches to them. And he tells them that unless they repent, unless they turn from their ways, they will be destroyed in short order. They, they don't have long to be around if they're not going to do what God wants them to do. And of all things, they listened. They listened to him. Look at verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed in what Jonah was telling them. Hey, God said he's going to destroy us. If we don't straighten up, we better straighten up. Of all people, the Assyrians did that. Keep reading there in verse 5. And proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. So we see in these verses that they fasted. They didn't eat or drink anything. They put on sackcloth. They sat in ashes. You continue to read and you see that. These are all signs of genuine repentance. It's what people do or what they did in this culture when they were truly sorry for something that they had done. Okay. Now, remember there in verse 5 it said, from the greatest of them to the least. Well, who's the greatest in any kingdom? The king. Right? Keep reading. Look at verse 6. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. So even the king is going to repent. That's significant, right? So when the head of state repents, and notice in verse 7 what the king does. And he, the king, caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. So the king makes a decree and he tells them, I want everybody to repent. Everybody needs to put on sackcloth. Everybody needs to cover themselves in ashes. Everybody needs to cease from eating and drinking. So this is an official decree that comes down from the king. And maybe most interestingly at all, at the end of verse 8 there, let them turn from his evil way, notice this, and from the violence that is in their hands. So the king renounces the very violence that they're known for. That's their calling card. We skin people alive. That's what we do. And the king said, you know, maybe we should stop doing that. Maybe God's really unhappy about that, and we should quit doing all these horrible things that we've been doing to people. So that's a big deal, because that really identified their culture, and that's who they were. So we've talked about repentance. If it's genuine, that's what it means, right? It's a change in lifestyle. It's not just, oh, my bad, sorry, and you're kind of sorry you got caught. It's i got to quit doing what I was doing that was displeasing to God. i got to stop doing that. And so the king makes that decree, so th there's no doubt that their repentance here was genuine. And the whole society, that says from the highest, from the king, all the way down to the poorest people, they all did this. And so that brings us to key lesson number one. I didn't realize I didn't have that up there, sorry. Key lesson number one. As we said this morning, there's a lot of things we can learn here, but we really want to focus on two primary things. If we learn these two things from Jonah, then, then we'll be better off for it as, as children of God. So we have talked about this before. In fact, just last week in our sermon, we talked about the fact that we cannot prejudge people. Okay, We cannot make the assumption. Well, I know God said that, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to talk to people about Jesus, but surely he didn't mean that guy over there. There's no way that guy, he's not going to listen. Or that woman over there, she's so deep in sin, there's no way she's going to, I'll just be wasting my time, so I'm not even going to bother talking to them. So we've said that you and I don't have the authority 
to prejudge someone and to assume they will not be receptive to the gospel. They may not be. They may spit in our face or slam the door in our face or tell us to get lost or something worse. They might do that, but then that's on them. Okay, so we can't make that assumption that they won't be receptive just because of their appearance or their lifestyle or, or whatever it is. Because when you look at this account, out of all the people anywhere, who would be the least likely you would think would repent? Probably the Assyrians, the most wicked people on earth. You say, well, there's no way they're going to repent. They're not going to turn from their wickedness. And yet they did. They did. The power of the word of God did this for them. And Jonah did this by proclaiming it. And so this is probably the second reason why Jonah didn't want to go there. The first reason, he's just scared of them because of how vicious they are. But Jonah was probably thinking, when God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, Jonah's probably thinking, you got to be kidding me. Them? Lord, come on, you've got to know that they're, they're a lost cause. Why don't you send me somewhere where I'm more likely to be successful? Right? Surely you can't think, those people aren't going to listen to me. They're probably going to kill me. But even if they don't kill me, they're certainly not going to listen to me. So that was probably the second reason Jonah was thinking it would be a waste of time. His time could be better spent somewhere else to some other group of people that might be a little more receptive because he had prejudged them. And there's no way they would repent, so he thought, but they did. So the message for us, again, is we have to make the effort. We've often said, yeah, God is not going to hold any of us accountable for conversions. How many people did you baptize? We're not going to have to answer that on the day of judgment because that's on them. I can't hold a gun to a guy's head and make him jump in the water. And if I did, it wouldn't do any good anyway. He's just getting wet. So that, that's on that person. But what we will be judged for, did we make the effort? Did we at least try to talk to somebody about Christ? And if we didn't, that's what I'm going to be held accountable. What about this wasted opportunity? You had an opportunity here, Mark, and you didn't do anything with it. That's what I'll be held accountable to, not whether or not they actually obey the gospel. So Jonah wasn't going to be held accountable for the Assyrians, whether they repented or not. God just said, I've told you to go talk to them. And once he did, then you saw this great example of repentance. I mean, there was no guarantee they were going to do that. But that's the lesson we need to learn. Don't prejudge whether somebody's going to listen to the gospel or not. Make the effort. And then let the chips fall where they may. The decision ultimately will be theirs. Well, as we continue on reading in verse or chapter 3, rather, verse 10, after this repentance. So the whole society has repented and the repentance is genuine. I wonder what God will do. Well, in chapter 3, verse 10, we get the answer. And God saw their works. So notice their works, right? It wasn't just lip service. They were, they were changing their behavior. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Okay, so this is an interesting phrase, right? God repented of the evil. So people go, well, wait a minute now. It, it's always been that repentance goes with sin. So when somebody sins and they need to repent, so it says God repent. Does that mean God was a sinner? Well, of course not. We know that's not true. God has never committed a sin and he never will commit a sin. God is righteous. And, but it says here that he repented of the evil that he said he would do. He was going to do evil to the Assyrians. And it, God was going to be wicked? He was going to do something wicked and sinful? Again, of course not. We know that's not what that's talking about. Well, what does it mean then? It simply means that God changed his mind. Right? God had said, I'm going to destroy them. But there's always that caveat in there, unless they repent. Well, when they did repent, God said, you know what? I don't have to destroy them anymore. Because God was going to show them mercy and God was going to forgive them for all the wickedness they participated in. 
because they were turning away from that. Okay? And so that's what that means, that God is going to forgive them. He's going to have mercy on them. And an important thing for us to remember here, when you look at that, we've often talked about, and there's a lot of people today, maybe you've been this way, or maybe you know somebody who's been this way, who said, you, you just don't understand. I mean, I've done such horrible things, there's no way God could forgive me. Don't put limits on what, don't tell God what he can and cannot do. If God will forgive the Assyrians who skinned people alive and did all those other things, God will forgive you and me no matter what we've done, as long as we repent. That's the key. Of course, if I don't repent, he's not going to forgive me. But if I change my ways, it doesn't matter if I was a serial killer and I killed 400 people. If I truly repent from that, God would wipe that away from me. As humans, it's really hard for us to do that, but God would do it. Okay? And that's the thing that we see here. So God, he's going to forgive the Assyrians because they repented. Okay? Now, look at chapter 4. We want to notice Jonah's reaction. So Jonah had gone outside the city. He's hanging out. He's thinking he's going to see this destruction. And then they repent, and God forgives them. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before you, or before, unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. So the Assyrians repented, God forgave them, and Jonah is furious. What? I am so confused. Wait, wait a minute. Isn't that what we want? Don't we want people to repent from their wickedness? Shouldn't we be thrilled? Anytime says, you know what? I've been a horrible person, but I'm going to turn from that and I'm going to serve God. Shouldn't that be something for us to celebrate? Not something to be mad about. Shouldn't it be? Yes, of course it should be. And that should have been Jonah's reaction. But he didn't react that way. He should have rejoiced and thought, because this must have been some humdinger of a sermon you got a whole society, the most wicked society. You've got them to turn from their ways. Man, that's pretty impressive. You would think Jonah would have been thrilled that, wow, I, whatever I said, it, it must have moved them and touched them. And they, I know as a preacher today, if somebody came to me and said, you know, Mark, I, I was embroiled in sin. I was doing this, whatever it was. And, but something you said in one of your sermons made me really think, and I decided to turn my life around. Well, I wouldn't be angry about that. I'd be thrilled that I said something that actually helped somebody, that made a positive dent in somebody's life. That's what we preach for, right? And so <laughs> I don't get why is Jonah upset when he, he should be thrilled that his sermon was so powerful that, that it did this because Jonah didn't want God to forgive them. Again, notice what he said there in verse 2. Was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? He said, but when you first told me to go to Nineveh, I knew, I knew it, I knew it. If they repented, you'd forgive them. You let them slide. I knew you would do that. Yeah, because God is love and God is mercy, right? He's not this evil ogre that some people want to make him out to me. God gives us every opportunity. He just wants us to do what he told us to do. And when we don't, he will give us another opportunity. And we don't know how many we're going to have. But Jonah said, I knew it. I knew it. Right? So this is really the third reason he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Number one, he was afraid. Number two, he thought, it's probably going to be a waste of time. And then number three, he thought, well, on the odd chance that maybe they do repent, God's just going to forgive him. Yeah. That's what he should have wanted. But he didn't. He's so mad about that. 
Why didn't, Lord, why didn't you hammer them? They were so wicked. They did such horrible things, man. I was waiting for you to blow that place up. That was going to be so cool. I mean, that's his attitude. That's what he's thinking, right? He didn't want God to forgive him. He wanted them to suffer for all the wicked things they had done. And so he's sitting there outside the city. And it's very, apparently the weather's very hot. He's upset about it. Well, God provides him with a, it says a gourd in verses six through nine. It's like a shade tree for one day to shade him from the sun. But then the very next day, God sends a worm to kill the tree. And so the tree withers away and, and Jonah's upset about that too. He's really upset about the truth. And so God asked Jonah if he felt sorry for the tree. Did, did you feel bad about the tree withering away, getting that worm and, and dying like that? Jonah said, yeah. That was like, yeah, I just don't understand. Why, why you got to kill a tree like that, you know? So he felt sorry for the tree. He had compassion on the tree but no compassion for the Assyrian. God, it, it, it's a tree. You didn't plant it. You didn't help grow it. It doesn't have a soul. It's not going to burn in hell. It doesn't really matter. But all those Assyrians, those are precious souls that live in Nineveh, and they were going to be condemned, and you don't have any mercy in your heart for them like you had for the tree. So we see this, look in verse 10. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which come up in a night and perished in a night. Again, you're, you're showing more compassion for a tree that was here for a few hours than you are for hundreds of thousands of precious souls who, I remind you, repented. They're not still wicked. They were, but they're not now. And you don't have any compassion. You don't have any mercy on them like you had on the tree. So God rebukes him for this. Now, notice in verse 11, the last verse in Jonah. And God asked him this question. Talking to Jonah, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six, four thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. So God is... Throwing this question out to Jonah saying, if I had destroyed the city, which I was going to do if they hadn't repented, but you've got 120,000 here, as we saw this morning, don't know their left hand from the right. In other words, these are little children. They don't know right from wrong. They didn't do the wickedness. They haven't skinned anybody. They haven't killed anybody. So God said, you would have me wipe them out too. And even the cattle, even the animal, the animals are innocent. They didn't kill. You want me to kill all them too? So you want me to wipe out all these people for the sins of some of them, which, again, I remind you, they have since repented of. But you, you were going to take pleasure in me wiping them all out. Why shouldn't God take pity on them? Because they repented. They said from now on, and who knows if they'll stay faithful to that, but at that moment, they were going to try to be faithful to God. So God's not going to punish them for that. He wants to reward them for that. So this brings us to key lesson number two, which is to be Christ-like, which you and I are all endeavoring to do, we've got to have the spirit of forgiveness, which Jonah didn't have. And Jonah was a prophet of God. He was a servant of God, but he's wrong on this one. That's why God is rebuking him for it. The spirit of forgiveness. Now, as we've said, if there is no repentance, then there can be no forgiveness. God is not going to forgive anybody who does not repent. He would not have forgiven the Assyrians if they hadn't repented, but they did repent. right? So if somebody doesn't repent for me, well, then I don't have to forgive them. But what if they do repent? We must be willing to forgive those people who have wronged us but they come to us and they repent. They apologize. They ask for our forgiveness. We have to give it. We can't hold a grudge. Well, you know what? I don't care if you're sorry or not. 
We better care because God cares. Look at Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Then came Peter to him, to Jesus, and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? How many times do I have to forgive somebody? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times so. Now, we're studying on Wednesday nights the book of Revelation, and we've seen a lot of numbers there that are not to be taken literally. That's figurative. It's the same thing here. It's not literal. It's Jesus saying, all right, you've got to forgive him 490 times. But on time number 491, just go ahead and shoot. It's not what Jesus is saying. Remember that number seven means complete. All right? And so Jesus is saying every time somebody wrongs you, but if they come and they ask for your forgiveness, they express that they are sorry, they know they are wrong, and they want you to forgive them, Jesus said every time that happens, you have to forgive them. You have to have that spirit of forgiveness. You don't have the option. You know what? I've already forgiven you 22 times. I'm not doing it again. God said, we do that, then we're sinning against God. We have to forgive, okay? And we may, well, but if he's doing it that much, his repentance probably isn't genuine. Well, it may not be, but that's not my call. I can't see into somebody's heart like God can, right? So if the repentance is not genuine, God will deal with it. But for me, I have to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, well, I've got to forgive them. Okay, every time they repent, we must forgive them. And think about this too. If we love our fellow man like God commands us to, we're supposed to love everybody. We are supposed to care about everybody's soul, even the people we don't even know. Because if they're in a lost condition, we know what that means. So we should care about them. So if we love our fellow man as we're commanded to, then shouldn't we desire to forgive people? Shouldn't we want to forgive them? Because that's something we ought to rejoice. I mean, if they repent, we should rejoice that they're repentant. We should want to forgive them, right? So if Cheryl did something wrong to me, and he comes and says, you know, Mark, I was wrong about that. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You know, I, I shouldn't have done that. And if I tell him, well, okay, fine, Cheryl, I'll forgive you because God makes me do it. So I guess I have to do it. Is that the right attitude? No. No. I'm like Jonah. <laughs> right? I don't need to begrudgingly forgive him. I need to be rejoicing. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if I did something to Cheryl and I went and asked for forgiveness, he needs to rejoice at my repentance. Right? Instead of, well, I'll, just, I'll do it because I have to. No, we should desire that. We should be overjoyed when anybody repents. I don't care what they did to me. If they realized it's wrong and they want to make it up, they want to make it right, that's what we want. And that's what Jonah should have wanted, but he didn't. Jonah didn't want God to forgive them. Jonah wanted God to punish them. Well, they repented, but look at all that bad stuff they did. Yeah, but remember what God's forgiveness means. All that stuff is gone if the repentance is genuine, right? So our goal must always be, and Jonah's should have been, to see people repent. Our goal should not be, I want to see God punish that guy. And that's easy to do. For us humans, that's very easy. I want, I want him to get his, right? But we learn out of Jonah that is not the proper attitude for us to have. I would much rather see him repent than burn in hell forever. Because if I would rather see him burn in hell, what kind of Christian am I? I'm not one. I'm not one. I, no Christian should ever ever wish that somebody be punished and burned. What they should wish is that those people repent 
and they begin to serve God and, and gain their salvation. That's what we should be focused on. Because we ought to understand that if punishment is required, and again, God will deal with it. If punishment is required, then that means they are lost. And no Christian should ever desire to see that. I don't want anybody to be lost. Because God doesn't want anybody to be lost. So if I'm supposed to be Christ-like, God wants everybody to be saved, then what does my attitude need to be? I want everybody to be saved. And that includes the Assyrians. And so Jonah should have wanted them to repent and wanted God to show his mercy. But that's not what he wanted. Jonah's mission was to spread God's word. And so was ours. Jonah tried to hide from God. We've all heard the old saying, you can run, but you can't hide. You cannot hide from God. Jonah couldn't hide from God. And really, he probably should have just thought back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve took the fruit, what did they try to do? They hid in the bushes. Like God's not going to know where they are. Right? And God did say, where art thou? It's not because he didn't know. He wanted them to confront what they were doing. How did you, who told you you were naked? Well, we're embarrassed. We're hiding in the bush. You can't hide from God. Adam and Eve couldn't do it. Jonah couldn't do it. You and I can't do it. And we need to understand that. So I ask the question tonight, not because I know this, I'm, are you trying to hide from God? This is not directed to any person here. I have no idea. But you know, and God knows. Is there a symbolic Tarshish that you're trying to go to to get away from God? In order to get away from God's mission for you. Because our mission is the same as Jonah's. It's to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. First of all, we are to live righteously and then we are to take that gospel. That's what we're supposed to do. So we cannot hide from our Christian responsibility. To pre please God, we need to be laboring in the task that he's given us. So we want to remember to learn from Jonah's mistakes. Okay, We need to attempt to take the gospel to all. Again, not prejudging, not, well, they're not going to listen we need to try to take it to everybody that we have the opportunity to take it to. Don't assume they will refuse to listen. Make the effort. And then secondly, Jonah sinned against God, as we saw, by trying to run away. But then what happened? Jonah repented. Did God go ahead and punish him further? No. God forgave him. God gave Jonah mercy, and Jonah wanted that mercy, the very same mercy that Jonah wanted to deny to the Assyrians. So Jonah's attitude, well, God, I want you to forgive my sins and overlook it, but not theirs. Yeah, well, well I repented, so did they. Well, but, but, no, there's no buts. If I want God's mercy, and I do, then I need to want God's mercy for everybody. Anybody that's willing to repent, I want God's mercy, not just for myself, but for everybody else. And that's what we need to do. We have to be willing to extend that mercy to those who have repented. So may God help us to learn from Jonah's mistakes so that we don't repeat them. So I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to be baptized into Christ. We can baptize you. We can do that. You can be immersed in a watery grave, buried with Jesus, and then you arise out of that water and your sins will be washed away. You will have God's mercy. doesn't matter what you've done. God will extend his mercy and it will all be gone. We want God's mercy, and we need God's mercy, and he wants to give it to us. So if you need to be baptized or not, we can take care of that. If you're a Christian, but you've fallen away, you've gone back into the world, maybe you're committing really horrible sins. Maybe even nobody else knows about it. But the good news is, God wants you to come home. 
You want God's mercy. You need God's mercy. And God wants to give it to you. So if you'll pray to God, confess those sins, repent for them like the Assyrians did. We're going to turn from that behavior. Ask God to forgive you. He will forgive you. He will extend that mercy. And those sins, whatever they are, God will forget those things and they will not be remembered against you anymore. See, humans, we can't forget stuff. Somebody does something wrong, we tend to, we may forgive them, but we still remember it. And see, God, the great thing, God doesn't do that. He forgets. It's like I never did it. So I remember a lot of the sins that I committed in my past life, but I know that he does not. Because all those sins that I did before I was baptized, they were all washed away. I still remember them, but God doesn't. And any time you repent and you're restored, same thing. Whatever those sins are, God doesn't remember them anymore. That's a beautiful thing. And we should want that for ourselves and for others. So if you have a need tonight, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. Someday you'll stand at the bar all night. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling, you'll fall on your knees. Facing the sentence of life or of death. What will that sentence be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the time to prepare, my friend. Make your soul spotless and free, washed in the blood of the crucified one. He will your answer be, what will it be, what will it be, where will you spend your eternity? What will it be, oh what will it be? What will your answer be? Again, we always we can thank Brother Mark. He always does a great job. We always be we, thankful. We, we get to hear lessons of his preaching each and every time we're together. Do we have anyone that's not had the opportunity to thank the Lord himself? Uh, We'll continue on. As always, we need to remember each and every one that's on our prayer list. Keep them in your prayers. Remember those that are sick. Uh, and pray for the, all, all those that have hardships in their lives. Remember services Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. And back again next Sunday morning. Bible study at 9 30, regular service at 10 30. Back again here next Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Please remember to do that. Please try to find somebody with you if you can. There's a lot of lost souls out there in our family and among our friends and just in the community around. Please turn to number 702. Let's sing the first verse of this and we'll have a closing prayer. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and for all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no but 